Good evening. I'm uh, honored to be here. I'm honored to be opening this symposium. And um, I'm especially happy, as I always am, to speak on this topic to uh, an audience of yogis and yoga teachers. Um, you heard a mention of my book, American Veda. Um, in that, I researched the entire history of the transmission of these sacred teachings that have come to us from India over the course of a couple of hundred years. And um, it became very clear to me that I think history will determine that that transmission of Vedic wisdom into Western cultures uh, will be seen as one of the most important historical developments of our era. It has, uh, I focused on America, but similar things are happening in other Western countries. It has uh, this infusion of yogic teachings of uh, principally the, the the uh, insights of the Vedic seers that we think of as Vedanta, and the methodologies of yoga, they have permeated our culture in ways that uh, people don't necessarily recognize, but are deep and profound, and have had a, an impact beyond what most people see. I like to say that we've becoming a nation of yogis. And by that, I don't mean just the, however, <laughs> millions of people taking yoga classes. I mean in our attitudes about life, in our understanding of who we are, what our, what our essential nature is, what the relationship between the individual self and the cosmos is, what religion can be and should be, and how we engage our spirituality, how we engage this impulse we all have to identify with something bigger than what's, as Walt Whitman said, confined between our hat and our boots. We are more than that, and we are coming to recognize that. And in our approach to spirituality, and I'm not just saying this as an observer, there are data that back this up. We are becoming more and more like yogis. Even people who will never set foot on a yoga mat are, in the way they approach their inner life, in the way they think of what they call God, in the way they understand the cosmos and the way they understand the purpose of human life, they are becoming more and more yogic. And the reason for that is this transmission of ideas and teachings that have been coming to us from India and building and building and building in momentum until we have all of you. We are here because of this wonderful lineage. Most of you are very conscious of that lineage and you honor that lineage as you should. That lineage, I, I see all the lineages that have come to us from India as part of one big lineage, a maha lineage I call it. And this maha lineage involves all of us. Everybody here is part of this maha lineage of all the teachers and teachings that have come to us over the course of, as I said, more than 200 years. I'm going to give you an overview of that history tonight, but I want to begin with this concept because it's very, it, it has become very important to me that especially young people who are coming into 
the realm of representing these teachings. You are not just representing what you're being trained to hear, to, to transmit here. You are, trans you, are, you are transmitting to the world eternal wisdom. And you are part of this Maha lineage. And it has become, to me, uh, uh, an incredible privilege to know that I'm part of the little, little part in this bigger l lineage. But it, and it also carries with it great responsibility. It's humbling and empowering at the same time. And I want to give you a sense of what you're part of. The teachings have come to us through a variety of streams and tributaries. And I'm going to give you a sense of what those have been tonight. And the, the principal one has been the gurus and swamis, yoga masters who have uh, come here from India and established something of a foothold in the West. Most of them are gone now, but they have left behind disciples and devotees who carry on their work just as this place is carrying on the work of Swami Vishnu and Swami Vish Shivananda. The first of those figures was Swami Vivekananda. I think of him as the Jackie Robinson of this transmission. Please tell me everybody knows who Jackie Robinson was. <laughs> well, there, there are some people who may not know. <laughs> I think of him that way because when he came here in 1893, most Americans had never met a Jew, and many have never met a Catholic, let alone a dark-skinned Indian man in orange. This was very strange in 1893. It's strange now, but it was really strange in 1893. And he was the first of the gurus to come here to have an important impact. He's worth many books and hours of discussion. In fact, Jeffrey Long is writing one of those books as we speak. Um, but he set the template for all the gurus who followed. He was the first, like Jackie Robinson was the first. Um, and he left behind a legacy not only of written works, uh, but of institutions. He started the first institutions that transmitted what most people would have called Hinduism at that time. They're called the Vedanta Society. Uh, the Vedanta centers are, were established in the early uh, 20th century, or late 19th, w in most of the big cities. And they still exist. And they have exerted a tremendous influence uh, through the swamis who were trained at their headquarters outside Calcutta and come here to monitor the sense that these centers. So Vivekananda was the first of the important swamis. And we think of him as, as a sort of founder of the teachings coming to the West. And the f in the first part of the 20th century, those swamis were pretty much the only game in town for people who even were aware of Indian spiritual teachings. Then in 1920, the person who the uh, Los Angeles Times called the, the first superstar guru of the 20th century <laughs> came, and that was uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. How many know who Yogananda was? How many have read Autobiography of a Yogi? How many have been meaning to read it? For okay. <laughs> How many saw the movie Awake with about Yogananda's life? Do you recognize me? I'm in it. It's my big screen debut. Um, I'm actually writing a biography of Yogananda now uh, because there's so much more to the story than you realize that when you read the autobiography, there's a lot more. Um, 
He's a very important figure in this transmission because he was the first of the important gurus to live in the West. He came here in 1920. He passed in 1952. And he spent 30, more than 30 of those 32 years in America. His headquarters are in Los Angeles. Have you ever been to the Lake Shrine in, in LA? He had the best real estate karma of all the gurus. They have properties, especially in Southern California, that are exquisite. You know, you, um, and of course, he left behind the auto, not only centers and temples all over the country, but um, his autobiography, which, of course, was uh, terribly important and had a big influence on a lot of people. So he comes in 1920, and he's the most important guru until the 1950s, through the Depression, through World War II. And then came the 1960s. Now, as I look out, I see a lot of people who were not born in the 1960s. But you've probably heard of the 1960s. And I, as a veteran of the 60s, uh, will tell you that whatever you heard about the 60s, it's true. Doesn't matter what you heard, it happened. It was a, a, a strange time, a crazy time, a difficult time. But one of the things that was happening with the a, a few developments. One of the developments was a change in immigration laws that allowed people from India to come here and settle and stay. The other was the growing up of the baby boomer generation and the advent of the counterculture of the 60s. There was huge waves of dissatisfaction with life as we know it. And people were searching. And in those days, the mass media had begun, and books were more easily available, travel was more easily available. And somehow, some way, these incredibly important, deep and profound and transformative teachings from India came to the attention of mass numbers of young people who took to them because they were an alternative way of looking at the world and an alternative way of transforming oneself and finding peace within and expanding consciousness without the other methods that were popular at that time and dangerous. And for those of us who wanted to end the war in Vietnam and seek social justice and make a, a more peaceful and rational, just world. The message that that begins inside and there are methodologies like yoga and meditation to tap into the peace that we all have inside was radically knew, and we embraced that. And that was the beginning of a massive shift in the collective consciousness in the West. You with me so far? And one of the things that happened was a lot of gurus and swamis and yoga masters started to come, and they found this ready audience, eager audience teachings. They all had their different angle into these teachings, which are much more diverse than people realize. But the, there was this unity of the Vedantic vision that um, permeated all their teachings. And they found each of them their own following and their own audiences and so forth. Next to Swami Muktananda was his successor, Guru Mai, one of the few on this screen who are still alive. And she actually didn't start her work until the 80s, but I wanted to include her because it was a very, as you can see, the word male-dominated comes to mind. And 
most of the gurus at that time were father figures or grandfather figures. And Muktananda, to his credit, anointed a woman to be his successor. And Guru Mai was a very important figure in the 80s for that very reason. Now look around. The world of yoga now is female-led to a large extent. This was not the case even 40 years ago. And this is an important development. And so I wanted her on there, even though she came later. This is Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who became the most famous of the gurus in the late 60s and 70s for reasons we'll come to. <laughs> And was very, uh, and we'll get into more tomorrow. He's the one. He really put meditation into the mainstream. This is Swami Satchidananda, who was a guru by of Swami Vishnu Devananda, uh, and this is Rajneesh, A.K.A. Osho, the most uh, iconoclastic of the bunch. This is A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Srila Prabhupada, who brought the Hare Krishna movement to us. You were entertained beautifully by devotees of his last night and before. This is Amrit Desai, who's still alive, and he started Kripalu in western Massachusetts, and they had some issues, and he's now uh, has his own ashram again in, in Florida. He's in his mid-80s. This is Baba Haridas, who amazingly is still alive and hasn't spoken in over 50 years, but he came here in the 70s and started Mount Madonna in uh, Northern California. This is Iyengar. This is Patabi Joyce, and those two were devotees of uh, Krishnamacharya, the great Hatha Yoga uh, reformer and innovator, and they were largely responsible for the current uh, emphasis on asana practice, especially starting in the 80s. This is Sri Chinmoy, who had a large following, mainly around New York. This is Swami Rama, who came uh, in the 60s and started the Himalayan Institute, which is still functioning in Pennsylvania and has a very nice magazine. And this, <laughs> this is a great story. This is... That w he was called Guru Maharaji, and when he first came here in the early 70s, he was called the 13-year-old perfect master. And um, his followers ha were presenting him as the next Messiah, the next... I have to tell you, this story is great. And it, he had a lot of publicity because he was this adolescent kid, and you know he was between 13 and 15, he had a big following. And then he decided, I think he was 16 or 17, he decided, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like this guru business. I don't like having all these disciples and being looked upon as the second coming of God and all this. In fact, I'm going to get married. And he, <laughs> and he married a US, an American flight attendant who was a few years older than he was. And I remember all this, and I thought, when I was researching American Veda, I said, what ever happened to him? Well, it turns out he went back to his original name, which was Prem Rawat, and he kept teaching, only in a business suit. And he had children, and he's still married and living in Malibu, and he's been traveling the world all these years teaching the same methods, only like to business executives, but without disciples. These are the main teachers who came in that era. And the gurus still come. But, but first I want to, I want to um, pay homage to some of the great masters who have influenced our lives in a big way but never came here. This is, these are terribly important people. You know Swami Shivananda. We honor him in this lineage because of the people he sent here. And you are the beneficiaries of that. This is Ramana Maharshi. How many know who he was? He was the most revered holy man in India until his death in 1950, but he's more famous now than he was when he was alive, certainly in the West. 
This is Sri Aurobindo, who also died in 1950 and was revered in India and little known in the West, but now he's very well known in the West, especially among uh, certain groups of psychologists who find his written works, you know, astonishing insights into the mind and consciousness. And this is Neem Karoli Baba, and how many know who he was? Okay, so you know Krishna Das, and you know Jayu Tal, and you certainly know Ram Das, the former Richard Alpert. They were all devotees of Neem Karoli Baba. And then the gurus keep coming, and uh, you know, how many have been hugged by Amma? Well, I'll hug you if you know, at the end of the night. And this is Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, who does product placement for my book on uh, on request. Um, and but it was it's not just the gurus and the swamis and the great masters who have come here, and it's not just the people they trained and the people who were trained by the people they trained. And it's not just them and their books and their institutions and temples and ashrams like this. All of these people and the literature, the great literature, the sacred literature of India affected very prominent Westerners who became part of this transmission. And this is the subtle part, the, the part that people don't often recognize, but is terribly important. I'm going to go through it quickly, but there are different... These teachings are universal. People in the West tend to think, they like to label things, and so this is religious, but it's not. And you'll see these teachings have affected different areas of life and the people in those areas of life absorbed those teachings and integrated it into their own areas of expertise and then transmitted it to the rest of us, sometimes in ways we didn't even know was happening. So, for example, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, how many know who they were? How many had to read their books in college? Okay. Most of you, when you did, when you were assigned those books, you probably didn't know there was anything Indian or Hindu going on. But those guys were deeply impacted by the books that were coming in, the translations and commentaries that were coming in starting in the early 19th century. They transformed the consciousness of people like Emerson and Thoreau. And when they then wrote and when they gave talks, and when their books are read now, people are being influenced by the Vedic tradition, even if they don't recognize that. Does that make sense to you? What we think of as Emersonian philosophy is deep roots, certainly in Western philosophy, but also in Vedic teachings. And this is, this is really important. So you see people who are Emersonians, they don't realize they're really, they're also yogis. And Thoreau called himself a yogi. There were no yoga studios in Concord, Massachusetts then. There were no meditation centers. They were absorbing these teachings through books, and those books opened the door for insights they got by being in nature and because they were highly evolved souls. And those, their influence continues to this day. Other philosophers and spiritual teachers in the late 19th century, a part of what was called the New Thought Movement, Madame Blavatsky, who started Theosophy, Mary Baker Eddy, who started Christian Science, the founders of the Unity Churches, which are very popular still, the founder of Religious Science, the Science of Mind, all these people were deeply influenced by the teachings of India. And some of them were around and actually saw Swami Vivekananda speak. In the middle of the 20th century, some of the most profound and important thinkers in American history were influenced directly by Swamis who were living here. This is Aldous Huxley. This is Houston Smith. How many know who Houston was? The most important scholar of religion in our era, beyond a doubt. Best known as the man who wrote the foreword to my book. <laughs> but famous even before that. 
if you can believe it. And this is Joseph Campbell. How many have heard of Joseph Campbell? All these men were mentored before they were well known, before they were really off the ground, by swamis of, of the Vedanta uh, tradition. And this is Alan Watts, the most unconventional of the lot. Go online and Google Alan Watts and you're in for a treat. He was the, the most best known and most popular translator of Eastern philosophies and texts in the 60s and 70s and uh, a, a really witty rascal of a guy who uh, you will be entertained by. The whole development of psychology owes a lot to certain pioneers who were part, in part at least, influenced by the teachings of the yogic tradition. This is William James, the sort of founder of modern psychology. This is Carl Jung. This is Abraham Maslow, the founder of humanistic psychology and self-actualization theory. All these people were deeply immersed and were influenced by the insights of the Vedic seers. This is Dr. Richard Alpert of Harvard, who most of you know as Ram Dass. And we wanted him in the psychology section. <laughs> it has influenced medicine. May, most of you know because you're here the, the degree to which yogic teachings and methods are being used in, in the context of health care because of people like Dean Ornish and Dr. Oz and, of course, Deepak. People forget he was a, started as a doctor. Physicists, Tesla, who was not an automobile, but a great scientist, who was a new Vivekananda. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. Heisenberg, Fritz Capra, who wrote the Tao of Physics. All these people were influenced by it. But the important thing is to understand that through them, masses of people were being turned on to the yogic philosophy and Vedanta through the works of people like this. It has influenced religious figures. These are Catholic monks you may have heard of, Thomas Merton, Bede Griffiths, and um, Father Thomas Keating, who th all these people were, their religious life was transformed by their exposure to Indian spiritual teachings, and they in turn influenced the people in their um, religious lineages. And the same is true of many rabbis and others who um, have adopted teachings. And, and so now we have a kirtan rabbi, of all things, who does kirtan in Hebrew. And we have centering prayer that he started, which was taken from mantra forms of meditation. It affected novelists like Herman Hesse and Somerset Maugham and mostly J.D. Salinger. How many have read Salinger? How many have read? Leave your hand up if you read anything after Catcher in the Rye. Read his later stuff. It's permeated with Vedantic messages and New Yorkers trying to live a spiritual life in the world. And it's great, it's great stuff. It influenced a lot of people. Poets. Walt Whitman. T.S. Eliot. People don't know. T.S. Eliot studied Sanskrit at Harvard. And if you read some of his works like the four quartets, you'll see sections from the Gita referenced. You'll see Krishna referenced. You'll see Sanskrit words. And of course, Allen Ginsberg, who was more recent, who was best thought of as a Zen guy, but he was a bhakta. He was, out, he was in the streets chanting with the Hare Krishna people and trying to pacify peace demonstrations by chanting Om, sometimes successfully. And it affected musicians who in turn transmitted these teachings to us. This is Ravi Shankar, who came here in 1956 at the invitation of the classical violinist Yehudi Menuhin. And 
that was history making because Ravi Shankar went on to influence jazz people like John and Alice Coltrane. Many people don't know it, but Alice Coltrane was became a Swami and st had an, her own ashram outside of Los Angeles for many years until her death about uh, nine or ten years ago. And Paul Horn, the, the great flautist, and Philip Glass, these are all people who were turned on to Indian spiritual teachings through music and became meditators and became yogis. But these guys, this is the main thing. Their part in the story is so interesting and so entertaining, but more important, so vital. When the Beatles started to meditate and go to India, it changed everything. Their trip to India, which is coming on its 50th anniversary, believe it or not, um, their, it, it was transformative throughout the world. And we don't have time to go into it now, but tomorrow at noon, I'm doing Beatles sadhana. <laughs> it's it's uh, and it will have music and videos, uh, and we'll show. We'll talk about how India's spiritual teachings affected them and their music, and how they in turn turned on the world to these things. And Here's a bonus. It started here in 1965 when they met Swami Vishnu because they were on this island filming Help. So that's where we begin tomorrow at noon. Now I know tomorrow at noon is not the best time for some of you, but this is the only sanctioned rock and roll you're going to get while you're here. So you may want to reconsider the schedule. <laughs> and if you can come tomorrow, uh, get on my mailing list and I'll be doing it at other places. Or you read that section of my book and at least get it without the sound. Now, all this that happened, what happened in the 60s and 70s was terribly important because these teachings spread. It started with counterculture, but it quickly, by the mid-70s, had gone mainstream because people started to do research on these methods, on meditation and yoga. And that validation by science brought it into the mainstream. And as a result, the teachers who were here stepped up their efforts to train Westerners to represent these Indian traditions, these lineages. 40, 50 years later, you're all here. But that all started and really took off in the 70s. There were always, these are some of the people who became sort of gurus in their own right, like Ram Dass, and I, I won't go into all, who all these people are. But there were always some Hatha Yoga teachers, for example, people like Lilias Folan, and Richard Hittleman, Indra Devi, Walt Baptiste, who were teaching asana practice mainly for a long time. But then it took off in the 70s. And it was so uh, important then that there had to be a, a journal. And so Yoga Journal started. And within two years of Yoga Journal starting, they had to have a special edition just for teachers by like 1976. So this was the beginning of the mainstreaming of yoga and meditation and methods like that. And now we, of course, we have Bhakti Fest and Kirtan everywhere. Back then, it, it was only the Krishnas who were doing Kirtan in public, and everybody thought they were crazy. They just looked like, you know, hippies who just got into Indian music. But now there's Kirtan, now there's hip hop transmission from people like MC Yogi and people like me who write books. All of this has been transformative in the world. Many of us back 40 years ago thought this was going to change the world 
in massive, visible ways. That hasn't quite happened yet. Many of us who were around then and looking back are pretty astonished at the mess that the world is still in because raising consciousness and creating inner peace in individuals was supposed to have transformed the world more quickly. The world has been transformed. It hasn't quite shown up on all levels yet. That's why all of you, the younger generation, is so important because this has to continue and it has to be brought into more and more people's lives and into the active work that people do in the world to make the world a better place. This is foundational. And it has had a huge impact on the spirituality of the West. And that has to continue and grow. Now, one thing I want to leave you with. All the teachers we honored tonight in this these Maha lineage, one of the things they did very well to have the impact they did was adapt these deep and profound and sacred teachings that come from the rishis to the era and the culture of the time they were teaching it. Things are eternal. Laws of nature are eternal. This wisdom is eternal. It's, it doesn't know time and place. But the means of transmission, the language we use, the, the methods of delivery, what used to be just a verbal transmission from guru, from guru to chela, now we have the methodologies to reach more and more people. You are going to be, and some of you already are, representing the Vedic lineages. How we adapt in the future will determine how well these teachings can change the world and how quickly they can change the world and the number of people they affect. The word, uh, there's a Sanskrit word, upaya, Many of you know it. It means essentially skillful means. And all the great teachers who came here had skillful means of transmitting these deep teachings in ways that people could understand regardless of what level of consciousness they were in. They knew how to address the person at their person's level of development. They knew how to translate ancient ideas into modern language, foreign concepts from a foreign culture into Western culture. And they did it with skill. But they also did it with integrity. And our job, if these teachings are going to have the impact, continue to have the impact that they are capable of having, is to represent these teachings with humility and integrity and to be skillful and creative in how you express it to people and how you adapt them to each era because 2017 is different from the summer of love in 1967 and 2027 will be different from 2000. 2027 will be <laughs> 2017. So adaptation has to continue. And you'll be t reaching different people at different places, at different levels of consciousness. So you have to be creative and open-minded, but at the same time you have to protect the integrity of these te teachings. You have to transmit them without diminishing what they are, without diluting their value, without corrupting their meaning and their purpose. 
And this is terribly important because you see signs of that kind of uh, diminishment around. Some of the things that are being taught in the name of yoga are questionable. And it's up to people like us, people like you, to make sure that the public knows that yoga is not just a form of exercise and there's much more to it. And to be creative in the transmission, but do it with honor. Honor your lineage. Honor the whole Maha lineage. And if we do that well, then in 2067, maybe there'll be a real summer of love. Different from the one 50 years ago. Thank you. Oh, okay. We have time? Oh, okay. They say we have time for questions. No questions about the Beatles. That's tomorrow. Swami colored. Any questions? Shocking. Yes. Oh, hello. Um, I'm interested in if there's uh, any influence of uh, yoga to Reiki practices, healing practices like that. I know Ayurveda is big here and things like that, but um, specifically Reiki. Is Reiki big? No, uh, I mean, like if there's the yoga, yogic influences from on that. Oh, has there been yogic influence on Reiki? Mm. That's a how, good how question. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not exactly sure. I know yo there are Reiki practitioners who are also yogis. Whether, but I don't think the origin of Reiki, at least as far as I can tell, because uh, it's from Japan, I'm not sure there was a direct influence. But here, in the West, there's some overlap with some of the uh, Reiki masters. Yes? No? No? Wow, I must have said everything. Okay. Yes? All right, you're allowed to ask questions about the Beatles. So. Thank you for your fascinating resume. I actually wanted to know if there are cases, you, you describe a bunch of successful cases. I wanted to know if there were obstacles, difficulties, challenges when some of these teachers came yes. and what they faced. Yes, thank you for asking that. Now, boy, how much time do we have? Um, every teacher who came here faced obstacles, some more than others. We celebrate Vivekananda, you know, who came, he was here and he, after his uh, initial, um, he became a big hit at the Parliament of World Religions in 1893, but then he did a lecture tour and he was in the Midwest. He was attacked everywhere he went. He, he got huge crowds of people, enthusiastic people, wanting to hear him. And then he got attacked mainly by conservative Christians who thought he was a heathen and he was um, going to uh, corrupt Americans. And they wanted to send him back to India. He stood up very well. And he had very choice words for the missionaries who were going to India with the uh, chutzpah to try to convert Indians. 
But of course, he was alone. He was the only one at that time. Yogananda faced similar obstacles. He was practically run out of Miami in the 1920s. There were people, there was a book, what was it, I can't remember what it was, but people were writing books and, and, and articles in the newspaper about these yogis, these swamis who were hypnotizing American women and taking advantage of them. And the, the flower of American womanhood was being threatened by these dark-skinned heathen who had hypnotic powers. This was all over newspapers in, in the early part of the 20th century. And there weren't many yoga teachers or, or swamis here at that time. But the ones who did, a lot of it had to do with the fact that, like now, a lot of the people who went to hear them and wanted to know more and wanted to learn what they had to teach them were women. Because the men were out, you know, busy, you know, working 18 hours a day. And so this was very suspicious uh, to certain people. So this happened. And of course the teachings themselves uh, f seemed, they were attacked as being pagan and heathen. And you know, when somebody comes and honors all the world's religions and talks about the commonality and the common core of transcendent experience at the heart of all religions, this is a welcome message to most of us, but to some people it was very, very threatening because all the teachers who came here, for example, would honor Jesus as a great master, but they wouldn't call him the Messiah of one and only Savior of mankind. And that was hard for certain Christian preachers to bear. So there's this two sides of the American psyche or the Western psyche in general, you could say. There's this open-minded, exploratory, innovative, inventive, creative spirit that wants to hear new things and try new things. And a pragmatic spirit that will, if something works, if something makes my life better, I'm going to adopt it. Those are the people who were initially drawn to all the teachers who came. But there's the other side of American life, and sad to say, we see it now arising. That is afraid of anything foreign, afraid of the, the person who's different, afraid of a teaching or an idea that threatens the status quo of what they believe. And those people were threatened by the gurus who came. And every one of them had to deal with it to some degree or another. When Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, after the Beatles made him so famous, he was giving lectures to thousands of people in places like Madison Square Garden. There were usually picket signs outside. That he, you know, he's the devil and he's, you know, we're all gonna burn in hell, be, you know, don't you know, stay away from him. I don't know about all the teachers, but I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure Swami Vishnu ran into that. I know Satchidananda did in New York and elsewhere. Um, that's just the way it is. And, but they, they handled it with such grace and such dignity that that was a teaching in itself. And it made them more beloved and more respected. So yeah, it's a very good question. As I said, I'm working on a biography of Yogananda's life and I'm, I'm, he went through it a lot in the 20s and 30s. The 60s, it, was, it, was, it, it had a different flavor because everybody, you know, the, the uh, older generation was already afraid that the young people were going to hell because of drugs and dropping out of school and anti-war protests and everything else. So when the, they got drawn to these foreign spiritual teachers, that was just part of that package to them. Except their lives transformed for the better because of their yoga, because of their meditation, because they went to an ashram. And that woke people up 
to say, oh, maybe there's, this is not just a crazy hippie thing. Maybe there's something of value here. And that led people to say, well, what's going on? Why are these young people going off to the Bahamas to an ashram or to India to an ashram or to wherever it was and coming back better human beings? more stable and more peaceful inside and less angry at everybody <laughs> and uh, not on drugs anymore. And that's when the research into these methods really took off. So the opposition faded. And now, I just a few months ago got a, a mailing from Kaiser Permanente, my health care provider, recommending that I meditate. <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, you're 49 years too late for me, but thank you very much. This would not have happened in the old days. Now, there's, you know, Kaiser has yoga classes. People like Richard Miller are teaching veterans People like Annika are teaching in prisons. This, this all started in the 60s and 70s with great opposition at every step of the way. But what works, works. And that's the bottom line. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I just wondered if you um, were able to pinpoint what was it that changed the messaging that was originally brought here from all those yogis so that we ended up kind of going down the road of Lululemon? <laughs> you know, I mean... So Life in America. Yeah, I, I mean, how, well, here, is this, there something that identifies... It's very interesting because skillful adaptation works and then it goes something happens and you can go a little too far. There's, uh, you know, commercial interests are part of it. Hey, yoga's popular. How can we make some money off of this? You know, this is it's one of the reasons there are, some, there are many very poorly trained yoga teachers because yoga studios, you know, they could pay the rent if they trained teachers. And they did it, many of in cases, in a very slipshod way. You're being well-trained here. This is a very different thing. Um, so there's partly the commercial imperative, partly because, you know, America always has a way of kind of um, reaching the lowest common <laughs> denominator or something. But, but, but let's, you know, we don't want to go too far with that because, you know, Hatha Yoga and you know, Yoga for Fitness and, you know, whatever it is that seems to be a, a, a small corruption, some of the people who do that then find out there's more to it. And so we have to be a little generous in our criticism, but at the same time, protective. We have to be vigilant that when things don't go, when things go too far. But f for my mind, as long as people are going to yoga classes or meditation classes or, you know, to people who are well trained, they'll find something and they'll find something more than they bargain for if, they're, if it's well taught. I think part of our job is to just keep reminding people, oh, I'm glad you practice asanas, I'm glad you practice yoga and it, it helped you lose weight. Do you, but, you know, there's really more, and you may want to look into, you may want to read this, or you may want to go to that advanced class, or you may want to go hear that teacher speak. You may find there's more to it. As long as we keep elevating the conversation. Otherwise, you know, but, but part of the adaptation is... What does that person need? What does that person want? I mean, one of the great things about the yoga tradition is it's so there's so much variety in it. People don't realize how multifaceted it is. But that 
that is a great strength. It's um, the variety is a great strength. It it serves multiple purposes for multiple people and what they want and what they need. And at the core is this incredible vision of unity and moksha and liberation. But if somebody just has back pain or wants to feel less tense, well, that's what you have to recognize and speak to. And then when that's done, say, you know, but there's more. There's even, and all the teachers did that. If I'm looking, you know, I'm do, looking at Yogananda's life, and I'm only using him as an example because I'm working on that book. He came here. His first lecture was called "The Science of Religion." It was all about the yogic vision of, you know, unity and all paths lead to the same goal. After a while, he became familiar with Americans, and you look at his lecture titles sometimes. Using concentration to you know, improve your business. Finding a spiritual mate. <laughs> but he got them in the door. And that's what happened. When Maharishi Mahesh Yogi became so famous with meditation, he wanted to talk about higher consciousness. There's, there was a story about him. His very first lecture in America, he talked about high, uh, states of consciousness. In the Q&A, somebody asked if meditation will help him sleep. And he said, yeah. The headline the next day was, Yogi says meditation cures insomnia. <laughs> There's a lesson there. You know, this guy just wanted to sleep. And, and, and he would say, I came to wake people up and they wanted to sleep. <laughs> and so... And then it became about stress management. People didn't, you know, people wanted to talk about enlightenment, but the audience just wanted to get off of Valium. So you have to adapt and then say, you know, when you're off your Valium, when you calm down, when you lower your blood pressure, you know, there's more to it. But, that, you know, that's, they all face that kind of thing. Thank you very much.